Okay, so I guess I'll uh, talk. Well, hey, I'm going to first start out by saying thanks to you guys uh, for coming here and listening to my crazy ramblings with my raspy voice. Um, I'm going to do my best to talk loudly, but uh, my voice is completely blown out, which is amazing. So Actually, I kind of like it, though. It sounds like, I don't know, it sounds good. We um, started a death metal band three days ago, and he's, he's just getting used to the vocal style. Yeah, I need to do some research online how to do that without hurting myself. Maybe turn the amp up, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know how to, I don't know how that works. Um, so anyway, hey, I'm going to talk about uh, some cool total nuclear annihilation stuff today. Um, I've got some things in here um, with, uh, I've just got some really cool slides in here with a bunch of pictures that haven't really been seen much, um, and uh, it should be hopefully interesting. So um, with that said, let's go through and talk a little bit. So um, introducing myself, so well, who are these people up here? I'm Scott, I designed and programmed and engineered and did a bunch of crap on Total Nuclear Annihilation, the pinball machine that was made by Mr. Spooky over here. Charlie, why don't you introduce yourself and say who you are. I am Charlie Emery, owner of Spooky Pinball LLC, the world's smallest functioning surviving pinball company. Yay us. Yay. Charlie will, is like refusing to stand up, so I think I'm going to sit. I'm comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to even it out. This is just it's a little strange. I am not okay, wearing so pants. I'm wearing um, shorts. So what I do for a living uh, is actually quite interesting. I work for a company called Pinball Life. Um, most of you probably have heard of it. Um, if not, you probably don't repair your own machines or, you know, you get your parts from somewhere else. But we're a pinball parts uh, manufacturer and reseller. So um, I've been doing that since... 2015, I believe, I think, yeah. And then uh, I do the engineering and a um, bunch of other technical stuff over there. Uh, and it's just, it's a lot of fun. Uh, and in my spare time, I apparently make pinball machines. I don't know why I do that, but it, it's something that I did. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's a fun job. I, my day-to-day -day life, if I actually were to tell you what I actually do for a living on a day-to-day -day basis, it's, it's very strange. Um, I can give a fun example. Uh, a few weeks ago, I had to take a kitty ride and, um, that my boss had purchased and rig up a Raspberry Pi with a display screen in it that plays uh, any video that we want. Um, when you play, th when you start up the kitty ride. And, and what video did you choose, Scott? What, uh, is anyone easily offended in this audience at all? No? Okay, so we got one person. Jay. All right, so, um, it's something called safe for work pornography. <laughs> so uh, basically what that is, is uh, kind of, you know, it doesn't really describe what it is, but they took a, you know, an old 70s pornography video and they did cartoons over all the dirty parts. So... You know, it's it's safe for work. There's still people in it, but they're not doing what you think they're doing. They're playing pinball or, you know, playing the harmonica or other gross kind of stuff. So, you know, it, it's pretty funny. If you guys are curious, you can look that up. I wouldn't recommend doing it at work, though. The sound is still a little bit offensive. Um, so anyway, uh, Charlie, what do you do for a living? Uh my wife, Katie, and I, who was out at Pinball Life yesterday for the charity event and is home with our son, Bug, today, uh, we own and operate Spooky Pinball LLC. We started on February 1st of 2013, uh, for those of you that don't know us, and to this date, we have put over a 1,000 pinball machines on this planet, which we're really, really proud of, and we do it all in a tiny little town in Wisconsin of 900 people called Benton. Uh, it's as grassroots, small town mom and pop pinball as you will ever see we're very content being where we're at uh, our place in the pinball world and we're lucky that uh, you know after me doing some games and we did a game for Ben Heck that uh, Scott had enough faith in spooky pinball to give us a chance to make total nuclear annihilation for him and to date it is our biggest selling game ever crazy so the, uh, the next thing on the slide about me is I, I have no idea what the hell is wrong with me and why I wrote what's my favorite mythical creature. I don't, I don't even know the answer to that. I guess if I had to pick something, it'd be like a unicorn or something. Or maybe like a combined unicorn with like, I don't know, a lion. I don't know. Yeah, like a lion, unicorn, lion man. I don't know. Charlie, what about you? What do you got? 
we're gonna stop screwing around from the set dramas. We're gonna get into something actually interesting. There, there is interesting. Favorite mythical in. creature. Um, well, I would say Godzilla, but that always gets me in trouble now. So I'm just gonna say Bigfoot. I've always had a weird Wait. phobia of Bigfoot. Godzilla's not mythical. No, he's real. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. He is. Okay. Cool. All right, guys. All right. Let, let's let's talk about some stuff. So uh, what am I gonna talk about today? Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the game, like what the game is, uh, a little bit of the playfield design. Um, I'm gonna go and show a screenshot of what some of the code looks like. I know some people might not be interested in that, but there are a certain amount of people out there that are nerdy like myself that would actually like to see it. Um, so I'm gonna show that. We've got some never before in art that, as, uh, that I was able to dig out of Matt Andrews who did the art for the game. Uh, we'll talk a little about the music. Uh, I'll show the light show generator um, that made those light shows. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about the game number two. Wait, what? Around. Oh? Not that. No, it's fine. Don't worry about it. There's what? Nothing, there's nothing weird in there. I didn't approve this. You're kidding. You're kidding, right? No, I'm not kidding. You're kidding. No, it's, 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 it's too late. It's too late. It's, it's made. The PowerPoint's made. It doesn't matter. Um, all right. Total Nuclear Annihilation brought to production by Spooky. So this game, uh, I think, is there anyone in the audience that has not played it or is not familiar with the game itself? Okay, perfect. All right. We got we got like a couple people. So it's a single level play field, which uh, is a, a thing that hasn't been done in a long time. Um, but basically, I wanted to make a game that was just really easy to understand, but hard to master, so that we could play dollar games on it, like with my friends, right? Um, for amusement only. Yeah, for amusement only, of course. Uh, it uses the latest pinball technology, uh, the P-Rock multimorphic system. Uh, so it has like full RGB. It's got an LCD screen. It's running a ridiculous computer inside of it. Um, it's meant to encourage multiplayer games. Um, so it's got things like co-op and uh, you know, strange modes in it, which you can actually work together to go through and destroy reactors. It's kind of fun. Um, the team that actually worked on this game uh, was actually more than myself. So I did the original concept and the original prototype in the Whitewood format, but uh, Charlie here from Spooky Pinball did all of the, uh, like, paying the bills and stuff. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> managing the team over there at Spooky. Sourcing all the stuff that we don't get from Pinball yeah. Life, all that kind of stuff, the custom metal, the play fields, we do that, we do the cabinets, we do the, the, the glass, the decals, all of that stuff. Yep, absolutely. Um, so, and we have uh, we got named Jimmy Lipham. He lives down in Austin, Texas. He did the uh, operating system, so he is much more smart than myself, uh, and created this embedded Linux system for TNA, so that the computer is super robust. It can just be powered off whenever; it doesn't matter. It's a read-only system. It's pretty cool. Uh, I don't know too much about it because it's way over my head, but it's definitely reliable and great. Uh, Michael Ocean was the uh, Skeleton Game framework. Uh, engineer, so he built this thing called Skeleton Game, which is what I started with, uh, and that is all written in Python. That basically gives you a blank game to start with that will, if you hit the start button, it will kick a ball in play, let you play three balls, and then end. And that's where you start. So it gives you just a good starting point. It's kind of cool. Uh, Jerry Stellenberg did the multimorphic P3 system. He did all the engineering for that and all the production for that. Uh, Matt Andrews did the artwork. Um, and David Van Es did the LCD animations, so the actual ones that we use in production, not the crappy ones that I had on my Whitewood that I may or may not have ripped off the internet. David um, Van Es has literally done the animations in every game you've ever seen from Spooky Pinball with the exception of America's Most Haunted. The guy's amazing. That's pretty crazy. Uh, yeah, he's super talented yeah. too. It's ridiculous. Um, and then I did the, uh, the rest of it, which was like the concept, design, music, sound effects, that kind of stuff. I, did it. I actually did the programming for this game as well. All the minor details. It's just, uh, yeah, it's so, it's so overwhelming, you guys. Don't do this, please. Save yourself. <laughs> all right, so early on designing the play field, like people ask me this question all the time, like how do, you, how do I go about designing a pinball machine? Did I just build it or did I do something in the computer first or what? So um, the unfortunate answer is I built it in 3D and SolidWorks. So SolidWorks, if you guys don't know, is a, an industry standard application um, that does uh, 3D uh, part creation right, and assembly creation for mechanical. Um, and you know, I use, I'm, I'm trained up in that software, uh, so I have a little bit of an upper hand in that, unfortunately. But it's, you don't have to do it this way. You can actually just build a pinball machine just by physically building it. 
Um, but this is how I did it. So here's a screenshot of an early on uh, version of TNA. This one has the plastics removed from it, so you can see the, uh, the stuff underneath. Um, but most of the parts are there. Everything is kind of mocked up in its place, and um, it's pretty cool. So, and from here, I draw this in 3D. Um, we then take, uh, we then take this this 3D file, and I export it out to AutoCAD format. Uh, I'm sure most people have heard of AutoCAD. AutoCAD is a great uh, 2D program. It is the industry standard of two-dimensional um, drafting. So, the uh, luckily SolidWorks will spit that format out, no problem. Um, and then this format can go off to the CNC, and, uh, off to the CNC company to actually cut the play field. <coughs> so um, the plastics and the, the apron, the ball guides, like all this stuff had to be converted into a flat DXF, is what we call that for AutoCAD. Um, so I had to convert all of that stuff out. So it was just pretty ridiculous and time consuming, but you know, it's worth it when you can send it off to a machine and have the machine actually cut the pieces for you instead of hand cutting them. So, all right, so with the code, what does the code look like? Um, I've got a simple um, example of the code that I'm gonna show you guys. Uh, as I said earlier, it uses the skeleton game framework. Um, it uses uh, Python, which is a programming language that is super simple. They actually teach Python to children to get their mindset uh, going in a programming sort of way, to get them start uh, to think in a programming way. Um, and I'm going to show you what Python looks like. It's basically English. So here's, uh, if you guys can see it, uh, hopefully you can read it in the back there. But uh, this right here is a little screenshot of the code that happens when a ball enters the scoop, the left scoop. So it has to make a few decisions uh, when, when the ball falls in there. So the first thing it's doing is, uh, this is the definition for the actual scoop switch getting hit right here. So it's saying it, if that switch gets activated for 100 milliseconds, then do something, right? So then it executes the code below. Uh, the first thing it's going to check is it's going to say, hey, is the, is the mystery mode lit, right? Should I award a mystery mode for this person? Um, and it's also checking if multiball is not active. So it's making sure that there's, you're not in multiball and mystery is, uh, is lit. So it's saying, all right, so is mystery going, uh, and you're not in multi-ball? Let's, let's fire off the mystery mode. It hands it off to the mystery mode and doesn't do anything else. It just exits right here. If, those two cri if mystery's not lit or it's in multi-ball, it goes on to the next thing and says, uh, is the reactor ready to be started? Um, and then also is, it make, it's also checking on this line, saying, and making sure that the reactor's not already starting because it's about to start that reactor. So if the ball goes in there and bounces, or if a switch is flaky, you don't want it to try to start the reactor multiple times. It could cause an issue. Um, so from there, it hands it off to the something I have called core control mode, which will start up the reactor for you. Now, if none of those are happening, right, then the scoop is not lit for mystery. You're not in multi-ball. You're, you're not ready to start a reactor. What it has to do is it has to kick the ball out right, at you extremely quickly, right? And it's something that the, mo the guys that do that play this game, um, you can see that that ball comes out of there extremely fast. Well, it still does make decisions before it kicks that ball out. So it looks at the user settings of the service mode and says, well, is there's something called left scoop processing speed, which allows you to slow that scoop down a little bit. So there's a, there's a few settings. There's normal, there's medium, and then there's lame which is a, just something kind of funny I put in there just as a joke. But first thing it does is it checks if that setting is set to lame. If it's set to lame, what it does is it'll wait 200 milliseconds, which is 0.2 seconds, and then it will fire the ball out. So it gives the, the player just a little bit more time to react to that ball coming out. Um, if that, and then if that happens, it just ends the uh, little definition here. Can we tell your Steve Ritchie scoop story? Uh, yeah, we can. The, the first time Steve played the game, he's like, Scott, you need to slow that scoop down. It's going to burn people. Yeah, it, he, was, uh, he was mad about that for like a few games. And then after a while, he, he came around and was like, you know, I like that that fast. You know, I can't do a Steve Ritchie voice. should be mean. Just let him kick of. it right in the square in the nads. Perfect. Yeah. Leave it yeah. alone. I wish Steve Ritchie was in here to, to, yes. to say that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was pretty funny. That was at MGC with the prototype, so that was pretty good. Or the Whitewood, I mean. Um, so the next one is checking if it's medium. If it's, on, if it's set on medium, it actually waits 100 milliseconds before kicking out. 
Um, and if it's set to normal or set to something else, it just kicks it out immediately. So it doesn't wait at all. So the minimum amount of time that that ball can actually be in the scoop on TNA is 100 milliseconds because of the top definition there where it says it has to, that switch has to be active for 100 milliseconds before it does anything. So that's kind of neat. I mean, I, I'm sorry if that's boring for some people. It is. Yeah, like, my wife actually was like, dude, you got to take that out of this presentation. You're going to, like. Go to the next screen fast. Seriously. We're losing Jack yeah, that's what, yeah, exactly. Like, I, you falling asleep over there, Jack? <laughs> okay, okay. He's trying not to. Okay, cool. All right, guys. So, and down here, too, check this out. This is, this is Python and the, the uh, P Rock game framework. It's basically English. That right there, that line of code is what I type in to make a coil fire. I don't have to worry about anything else. I don't have to worry about disabling the coils or making sure it's on too long or like not on too long or anything. Like that is the code that I fire I, I fire that coil. It's, it's super easy. I think Python was a really good choice for this because it's really, it, it's not intimidating because the rest of the whole structure and making a pinball machine is hard enough as it is. You might as well use something that, that kind of makes sense. All right. so. We're done with that. Let's look at some of the artwork stuff. This is kind of cool. I'm going to show you guys some of the Easter eggs that are hidden in the artwork, um, which is pretty cool, actually. Um, that artwork was done in, uh, it was done by Matt Andrews. Um, it's that OutRun style artwork. You know, it's meant to look like this retro futuristic style thing that, uh, you know, I, I don't know if it's actually a thing. I guess it's like the steampunk of the 80s, I guess is the easiest way to explain that. Um, you know, if you guys know what steampunk is, some people don't, some people do. Um, but anyway, here's the final back glass. So this is what it looks like in production. Um, has the score windows cut out of it right through the uh, the artwork that was there. How many uh, How many of you guys are Photoshop guys? That was completely done in Illustrator. That's amazing. To if you're an art nerd and if you've been in that realm, to do that in Illustrator is insane. But yeah, that, that's Matt Andrews. He's pretty. Pretty damn amazing. That's pretty crazy. And I've handled artwork from uh, several artists, including like Rick Ferrer, one of the big names. And yeah, I've never seen anybody send me a file in Illustrator to that level. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. Something, too, to point out here, and uh, it's pretty neat, is the girl on the back glass is actually modeled after a picture of my wife, which is pretty cool. Matt Andrews um, came up with that idea. He Somebody like, scoring points. Yeah, you know what? I mean, I totally came up with that. Yeah. It was my idea completely, but uh, no, it was like a, it, it's a thing that sort of happened. Uh, I think it was really cool. I think it's a, a nice little homage to her. She did a lot actually on this project behind the scenes by um, not making me do as many chores as I needed to do uh, while I was working on this game. So that is her little nod there. So not really an Easter egg, but you know, that's what that is. So, um, so here's uh, a little sketch. This is cool. This is actually a sketch that Matt Andrews sent me and uh, it, when we were first trying to lay out the back glass. So it's pretty far along, actually. So at this point, the girl actually does not look like my wife in that picture. But, and you can also see the nuclear is missing from there. I don't know if, uh, have you guys heard the story about why the nuclear got added? No? Okay, so uh, in February of 2017, maybe? I think that's my thing. Yeah, so in February 2017, um, Atari renewed the trademark to the game from the 90s called Total Annihilation. And Atari is, at this point right now, um, they've got a lot more money than I do. And uh, I don't know if you know how court works, but <laughs> it's pretty much the person with the most money wins. Um, so <laughs> so uh, we had, uh, I don't know if Yancey is here, but we were trying to come up with like ideas to, to change this, and, and Yancey came up with uh, throwing nuclear in the middle of it. And then he was kind of like waiting for me to like realize what the initials were, and I wasn't getting it. He's like, he's like, he's like, get it? I'm like, sure. But it ended up being TNA, which is kind of silly. So, and Charlie tried to call it Scott Denisi's total annihilation. I was like, that's just. That's ridiculous. Okay, let's move on. Let's take a look here. Let's look at some of the hidden stuff in the back glass. Um, this image of the back glass you're looking at right here does not have the score displays in it. It's actually, uh, I, I just put the wrong image in the presentation, but it's kind of cool to see that. This was done before we had 
the score displays actually in the back glass. So it's slightly different. Let me like scroll back real quick here. You can see some stuff was moved around. The, the pyramid was moved up slightly to make room for those score displays. And the spooky information on the left side was also moved up. So there you can kind of see what see the difference there. So let's go into that. So let's see. First thing is over here on the right side, there's a guy standing in front of a computer. Um, this zoomed in on it. Uh, that is actual, that's an actual screenshot of the computer code, the core control code that's, uh, that was just actually from my laptop. Matt's like, you got any, uh, you got any code we can put in here? Like, what do you want me to make it say? I'm like, well, I mean, I can just, I can just like, you know, I alt print screen, right? And I'm like, here, use this. <laughs> it's like, so that's kind of funny. You can see like there's like some comment lines in there. It actually looks pretty clean. Uh, my code isn't super clean like that. Like if you actually looked at the code, uh, you know, but it looks good there. It's kind of funny. And like no one would have ever really known that, you know, you can't read it really. Um, so some other cool stuff. Let's see. All right. This thing down here on the nuclear barrel, it says parts from Terry on it. <coughs> well, well, Terry is my boss. Terry uh, is the owner of Pinball Life. And he, um, he helped out tremendously on this project by um, giving me whatever parts I needed to build the prototype. And I am very, very thankful for that. Um, I could not have done it without Terry's support because um, he, he also helped me just, you know, I was able to, don't tell him, hey, this is being recorded, crap, I'm gonna get fired. Um, but uh, he gave me time during the day to actually work on it a little bit when I had some free time to just uh, like, you know, think about some things and and do that. So that was pretty nice of him to, to let me uh, let me do that. But <clears throat> all right, what's next on here? I don't even know. I did this like oh, this is good. You guys ready for this thing? So down here in the bottom corner, there is a there's a busted down um, movie poster with some lights on it. This is actually a movie poster of the movie Lion Man. I don't know if you guys have seen that movie at all. It's really uh, it's really this good. It's in the future. It hasn't come out yet. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I forgot about that. This, has, this movie has not come out yet. Um, this movie stars uh, two people, uh, Doug Manley and Jay Brand. Um, those people actually are sitting in the audience right now, right behind you. Stand up, guys. Stand up. Hey, come on. Stand up. These guys, those are in the movie. They're in the movie Lion Man. <laughs> High five it. <laughs> they aren't sitting together. What did Doug do this time? I don't know. <laughs> That's good stuff. But anyway, that's a, that's a movie poster. We wanted to sneak in some kind of Lion Man reference in there because, you know, why? I mean, because Lion Man's Lion Man. So I mean, everyone knows that. All right, what do we got up here? Oh, there's some, there's some stuff up here. Check this out. Let's zoom in up here. So um, there's some, just some billboards in the background. Matt Andrews wanted to sneak in some billboards because there were some joke, uh, there were some joke advertisements in my Whitewood machine. Uh, I think I had an advertisement for Crystal Pepsi at one point. Um, just because I was joking, I was like, hey, I'm going to put advertisements in here from the future of failed 90s or 80s products that, you know, and but pretend that they were like, they caught on a lot and like they are like the thing, right? So um, the first thing over here on the left side is something called Biddy Disc. I'm sure you guys can probably recognize the shape of that. Remember those mini disc things? Um, those uh, didn't catch on, but in this reality, they did. All right. I liked mini disc though. They were they were small. They were yeah, but it was like a CD inside there, but it was totally protected, so you couldn't scratch it. You know, it was it was smart. Is that what happened? Oh man. All right. So apparently, apparently it caught on everywhere except America. So that is what I was informed. All right. The next thing. All right. Super obvious. Crystal Cola. This was invented by uh, Crystal, who's sitting in the audience there. I'm just kidding. No, she didn't invent that. It's with a K. It's spelled wrong. Close, though. But no, there's like a missing, there's missing letters. Um, so anyway, uh, th that was a Crystal Pepsi, like, throwback, like, make fun of thing. So it's kind of funny. Um, this is apparently, I think this is supposed to be the Fiero that I have. Um, <laughs> I haven't quite figured that out yet. Matt won't admit to whatever that is. Um, but I thought it was kind of cool. He called it the S19. I don't know, made by some fictitious company. Um, Matt also put his own little logo in here which he hid pretty well. I th it's kind of fun to, to try and find in Matt's artwork where he hides the logo. He's really good at disguising it, so it's very hard to, to find. He also put in, and this took me forever to find, and we didn't see this until like much further along. 
It's the old school spooky pinball logo. Remember that? Or that spooky podcast logo. Yeah. Didn't that like decommissioned yeah, a long time that ago? That was before Greg was nice enough to draw us a whole ghost to go with the eyes, and we had ah. just the eyes. Yeah. Nice. All right, what else do we have here? Oh, okay, so cool. There's some more drawings in here. This is the cool little futuristic helicopter that Matt drew. So Matt sent me this little image when he was trying to sketch out ideas for a futuristic helicopter. I thought it was interesting. It's kind of cool. That's, uh, that's the final on the left, and then on the right side is his uh, sketch. So pretty neat. I think there's another one of these, too. Oh, yeah, this thing. This thing Matt calls uh, the chicken mech. I don't know. Uh, it kind of looks like a chicken, I guess. I doubt it flies, so like a chicken. But yeah, it's kind of neat, though. He drew that up, and I was like, oh, yeah, we got to put that in there. That's, that's cool. So very talented dude. I mean, even that black and white photo of that is just really cool. All right, is there any more? Oh, there is more. There's more. OK. Um, this guy is the security guy. So Matt drew up a, a security guy who's supposed to be like, you know, trying to fight you. And, um, you know, and I don't know. He's just think he's like announcing things and stuff. I don't know. But he put him up there. But I got the, uh, the actual sketch that he drew, which was really highly detailed for how much he scaled it down. Uh, it almost feels like a waste. So but there he is. He doesn't have a name either. It's just he's just security guy. Um, so that, let's, let's go back real quick. So what he's talking about is, um, the, uh, the girl in the back glass is holding a, she is holding a red button. And this is funny because it wasn't until about three or four months ago that I even knew that Pat Lawler hid red buttons in his artwork or in his, uh, in, you know, his machines. Um, so this is actually just a coincidence, but a really neat coincidence. So, <laughs> yeah, kind of neat. I, you know, I should have circled that. So that, that's kind of fun to talk about. Yeah, it's a red button, and she's holding it. It's a detonator. And her name is Scarlet. Oh, yeah, her name's Scarlet. Like that's, that means red, right? Mm -hmm. All right, <laughs> cool. Another accident. An another accident. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is it? All right, so some play field art. Check out this. So on the left, we've got the actual production play field art. And on the right was one of the sketches that Matt gave me um, when we were first doing some things. And uh, I put some notes on it in red to, uh, to have him um, incorporate some of this stuff into the plastics and uh, also the play field. So there's things like, uh, you know, spell core on the top. There's the grid down in the center. Um, there's things like spinner advances reactor. Uh, all sorts of other little random things here. I'll scroll down a little bit to see more here. Um, in the middle, there's a destroy all reactors for total annihilation. And you can see that actually made it onto the play field there, um, right above the island. Um, I believe, Jay, you drew this island, didn't you? Yeah, I think you did. And the white wood. So it had people on it, but then when I cleaned the play field with Novus once, they started coming off, and I decided just to, to kill them. Plus they had like, you know, they were like had spears and stuff and it didn't really fit. It wasn't real futuristic. If they had laser guns, then maybe it would have. <laughs> All right, and then uh, down below we got the ball save timer and then the uh, bonus data display module, which is kind of fun. So um, here's some of the, uh, also the uh, artwork mock-ups for the plastics. So the bottom, obviously, is the production plastic, and the uh, the top would be the, uh, the sketch that he did. So there's the completing the grid and how it made it on the production game. Uh, there's the spinner advances reactor, which is kind of cool. Man, I just keep looking at this stuff and just like, I, I could never do art like this. It's just very, uh, very impressive. Um, there's spell rad to light mystery. All right, that's on the uh, left side there. Um, this is really cool, too, actually. So Matt created a custom font for TNA. So this, this is the font that's actually used on the side armor. So the side rails have a laser cut total nuclear annihilation in them. Um, and this is, this is what he created for it. So it's just like a, a futuristic laser font. Um, he also made it, which is quite interesting, is you'll notice that this font is also laser friendly. So you can, uh, you can for the most part, you can cut uh, cut all of it, except for the B, I think. The B had a problem where we had to fix it later on, but like a piece would fall out of it. But all good. All right, so the music and sound effects. I'm going to start speeding up a little bit, too, because like I'm running low on time. I got a lot of stuff here. So 
Um, the music and sound effects, um, I composed the music itself. Um, each reactor in the game has a different soundtrack, um, that, so it's a different different sound uh, or different song completely. Um, all the sound effects are all custom, uh, and I did all of this using 100% digital uh, music composition software. So some of, some of you guys probably have seen some of the live streams I've done with a lot of the analog hardware. Um, I did not actually use the analog hardware in the composition of this music. I did it all digitally, which is, you know, it's fine, but uh, some of my purest friends kind of, you know, shake their heads at me. Um, it's just, it's too hard. It's too hard. You got when you're in a time crunch, you gotta, you gotta do what you gotta do. But um, the album itself. So I actually released the album. The music is is released on a on an album on iTunes, on you know Google Play Music, on Spotify. Um, released that in January. Uh, or actually, I released the digital in February. We released the uh, we released it on cassette in January, which is kind of fun because we're like, hey, cassette, you know, 80s, like the cassettes caught on in this reality, and uh, you know they they became a thing, right? So cassettes and mini discs apparently. Mini discs were too expensive and stupid to make right now. Like it just they're they're done, I think. Right? Like no one uses them anymore, right? No, they're done. they're gone. Okay, perfect. You have one? Yeah, you still use it? Sometimes? Oh, okay, so he's saying those are really good for connecting to the soundboards when you're recording live concerts and stuff. So, no? If the band will allow you, yeah. No, oh, well, all right. Okay, so um, the light shows. This is interesting because um, at first, uh, the light show generators, I used the Dutch Pinball Suite. And uh, later on, I actually switched over to the open source skeleton game light show generator. So this thing allow you to create a little movie. And what you do is you export this movie into a framed PNG sequence, is what it's called. It's just a bunch of images. And what it does is it plays it back over the top of a picture of your play field. And it will create a light show for you. And then you just take that light show file and dump it in your game. And voila, there you go. You have a track mode stuff. So it's uh, kind of like cheating. Those light shows that I did, I did not do by hand. So that would have taken an eternity to make those. It would have just been insane. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, this is a bad example. I put like a, I was messing with something at when I was taking screenshots and I was making, I was trying to make a, a TNA scroll across the, in a track mode, which I haven't done yet. Maybe I just spoiled the next release <laughs> surprise. Um, but, you know, I, I just did it in white and that one, but it's full RGB. Like, so TNA is uh, all the GI, all of the inserts, everything is RGB. So I can do whatever, you know, whatever I want on it. It's basically just a very, very low resolution display at that point. Yep, pretty cool. Um, so now let's, uh, let's show some stupid, embarrassing photos. I have some good ones in here. These are pretty fun. Uh, so this, this photo we're looking at, this is, this is super interesting because um, this is at MGC 2017, right? Yeah, MGC 2017. I get the dates all messed up. Um, I needed a cabinet that was uh, more shallow than the normal spooky cabinet because the single level play field would have looked really funny in a Rob Zombie cabinet where it's very deep and built for ramps and you know things sticking up very high in it. So Charlie built me this cabinet um, and brought it to MGC and we left, it was like sitting in the back of the spooky booth the whole time, no one asking any questions. I'm not sure why uh, Sarah and I got into the cabinet, um, but I mean, if Scott there's an was that excited to see it. That was the first I time you'd actually seen a total nuclear annihilation cabinet. That was the first time I've seen it in real life, yeah. So it wasn't on legs, it wasn't painted, nothing. So yeah, that's, uh, that's that. I looked really funny and stoned. I promise I was not. And, and we knew at that point that the game was going to get made. Nobody else did. So the fact that that thing sat in the booth all weekend and nobody asked any questions was like, whoa. That was pretty funny, actually. So anyway, I, d I just decided to sit in it because that's what normal people do, right? Yes? No? I think. All right, well here's a picture of me actually painting that cabinet. So that's pretty fun and boring. All right, and there's a picture of Andrew. Andrew is the owner of APB Enterprises. Um, he does eat paint, but I promise he is a sane person. 
Um, he's helping me as well. Andrew was a big, a big help assembling the prototype machine. Um, he came over after work and helped me uh, put, to put together the wiring and anything else that I needed to do. Uh, this was officially the first time that I saw the back glass printed on glass. So, like, translates are one thing, but an actual, like, that art printed on real glass, and by the way, that's really heavy, and I was, like, struggling to hold that up for as, as long as the picture was taken. Um, I'm just like, come on. Um, seeing that, like, with the sunlight shining through it is totally incredible. Like, it's, I, I recommend if you guys are ever getting stuff printed on glass, do it. Like, it's, it's just amazing. Uh, anyone building a custom game, price out how much it is to print something on glass because it just makes that much of a difference when light goes through it. All right, did I skip one? No, I didn't. All right, so here is a picture of the prototype machine when I had an actual white wood in it that was cut from um, spooky pinball. So this one's cut and the po inserts were populated by spooky. Um, and then I just started populating it for fitment. So this was kind of cool because we had the side rail prototypes on there as well. I don't think these are the actual production ones. I think there were some minor changes that had to happen, but uh, yeah, I mean, it was pretty close. We, did, uh, we didn't do too many takes of that, but this is a really cool look at when I was first mocking up the parts to make sure everything was fitting. Um, here is the first set of plastics ever made for TNA. And uh, I think this was this picture was taken. Did you take this? I think this is yeah. So Charlie yeah, took this. Yeah, that's in the print room at Spooky. Yeah. So he was very happy to send me that. Um, I then got those uh, plastics, and I was able to kind of mock them up on the white wood that I had, um, and just make sure that they fit, make sure they looked great. And it's just it it blows your mind when you start seeing stuff like this come together because you can see it in a computer all day, but when you see it physically start coming together, it, it's completely different. It was fun too because uh, when we brought the plastics in, we brought the printed play field in at the same time and Scott's office is at one end of the building at Pinball Life. Terry and Margaret are in the front half. So I went into the front half. I always go through the, uh, the back half of the building where Scott is. I went to the front half and we had everything sitting up, two sets of plastics, two sets of play field, everything that Scott needed to, to complete a pre-production model. And Terry's like, Scott Dennis, get up here now. Like, he was pissed. He sounded <laughs> pissed, like, which isn't, you know, isn't uncommon. I mean, <laughs> I get in trouble at work sometimes, like everyone else, I think. Maybe that's not normal. I don't know. But, yeah, Scott um, walked in, and I, I think we <coughs> almost made him cry. He I almost got, like, they almost oh. got a tear out of me because they had all the, they had, I think, two play fields printed. They had the cabinet decals. They had the back glass. They had trans lights. There was just... It was everything. Just, it was. I, I was blown away by seeing that because, again, seeing a picture of the playfield with the art on it on a computer screen and then seeing it in real life with a clear-coated playfield is completely a different experience. Like it's, it's nuts. So, um, yeah, I was I was trying to hold back tears because uh, he was recording me and I didn't want to look, you know, like a like a person who cries. But I guess it's normal to cry. So maybe I just should have. I probably just should have. You know what? I <laughs> can't do it now. <laughs> I'm too happy right now, guys. All right, so here are the first the first pictures of the fully assembled with all the parts that Charlie brought me that day, um, the prototype TNA. So this is uh, these pictures are taken at Spooky Pinball headquarters where I brought the game uh, to show the guys there and to start really going through and taking pictures, like real professional pictures of it for the flyer and for the announcement um, of the you know the price and everything and and opening up sales for it so it's pretty cool and if you look too the the apron decals are actually prototype that I made oh yeah uh, stealing elements from Matt Andrews artwork because they weren't done yet and we needed to do something for the photo shoot and then Scott kind of had him go back and do like it was like the next week he had them done but uh, yeah we threw them in there for for giggles and. Yeah, we just totally I still forgot have a about set it. Of those actually. I mean, we were in a hurry to make sure this thing was just got done, but there were like things that we forgot, like the apron cards. Mm -hmm. like, I forgot to make those. Um, you know, it's just it's fun stuff like that you forget. Um, but uh, that this is interesting because I think that machine um, was at Spooky, 
and actually had its back glass destroyed. <laughs> my fault. Was it your fault that it actually? Fault. Oh man. So I was on the other end of the building, and they had taken my game apart to look at some things, and I had the um, the back glass, the prototype back glass in there, and uh, I hear uh, like a, poosh, you know that noise, the tempered glass breaking noise, and I'm like, oh, someone's in trouble, <laughs> you know, like kind of laughing about it. And I kind of walked over to where the noise happened, and it was all purple and pink all over the floor. And I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> we made him another one. It's OK. Yeah, I mean, I got another one. It's, it's OK. But it wasn't, it's not the It occupies one. the space the original one was in, Scott. But it's not the one. I want the one back. It does, it's not coming back. Little back end just like hanged it there. <laughs> yeah, that's too great. Oh, man. Uh, so we took it outside to take pictures. So if you know anything about selling pinball machines, you always take them outside, put them in the shade, and then take pictures. Don't ever put them in the sun. makes them look awful. I don't know why. But the, the shade is perfect. <coughs> so there's a picture of us hanging out. Uh, I think there's, uh, there's old man Brian Kelly there. You got Jesse. There's Brian. There's Bug in the background. And there's me standing there doing some God knows what on my phone. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that. And um, you know, there's a couple of my friends enjoying the, the prototype machine, like any normal person would do. I think that's normal behavior. Um, they could be they could be mythical creatures. Um, so in 2017, uh, during Expo last year, we had a little open house release party for TNA where we brought in. Well, I got I brought in all three of the iterations of pinball machines that I had which were the, in the order that you're seeing here, kind of uh, starting with the closest one, that's a production machine with a butter cabinet. The middle one is the prototype machine. And the one in the far back over there where the guy in the red shirt is playing, um, that is the white wood. So we had three machines there um, and it was a great time actually. And you can see in the background too, actually, there's a Playboy on top of one of Jay's creations called the Vajazzler, which is a giant, uh, turntable which has a power outlet in the middle that can actually rotate and still work that can rotate an infinite amount of time uh, so you put a pinball machine on there you jump on it you play in infinite the okay infinite maybe not but yeah I, I and the it. silver curtain right on the other side of the playboy is one of those funhouse vortex tunnels that you walk in and it screws with your balance and inside it was an orbiter one and you had to play that in a vortex tunnel it was I got through the, the first ball and I was well, I'm done. I'm out. Couldn't do it. <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty cool one too as well. Um, yeah, that's that, that was the release party we had. Um, here's a random picture of Charlie and I at uh, Midwest Gaming Classic. Well, we jumped in the Stern booth and just started signing Ghostbusters flyers for people. Um, no one really cared or kicked us out, so we just kept doing it. I don't know, like I, I guess no one. Yeah, it was fine. I'm. We fine. threw that on Facebook, and George Gomez offered us jobs. It was cool. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty funny. So, um, here's another picture from MGC. This is a picture of the Whitewood audits. Uh, there's the section in the service menu called Reactor Audits, which tell you how many times each reactor has been started, um, and and what you can see down there in the bottom is actually, Bo it was this was after Bowen went through and completely annihilated the game. So. There is one total annihilations in the, uh, on in the original Whitewood. On the original yeah. Whitewood was the first time it was it was done. And what's really funny about it is if you look at Reactor Nine started, there's actually that was done two times. Bowen didn't beat the game the first time he played it. He got to Reactor Nine and and failed miserably. And we pressured him again to do it. And he by got failing, to Reactor Nine and failed miserably. Yeah, <laughs> because could you imagine? Can you? Can you imagine that feeling? I've never been to Reactor Nine I've without never been with the glass five. on. I've never been Reactor Five. I've yeah. I mean, I started Reactor Five one time, and I felt really good about it. Like that's that's great. Um, but could you imagine getting to Reactor Nine and then draining on Ball Three and watching that bonus count start? I mean, that would just be. That's a that's ah, oh, it's awful. I literally can't imagine what that must feel like. Yeah, it's it's pretty bad. So yeah, mm, I don't know. Anyway, so uh, I'm going to talk. The next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, about the next game um, that I'm working on now. There's a preview of the next slide on my screen right now. Charlie doesn't know what I have on it, but anyway. 
you got Scott. Nothing. That's it. Charlie didn't Charlie didn't uh, approve my presentation before I, before I did it. So anyway, um, the, the theme actually has been decided on <laughs> um, at this stage. Uh, the current stage of the of the project is I've already cut two white woods. Um, I am in the process of cutting a third white wood because I have geometry errors uh, that just don't work right with the guide rails. Um, I'm probably going to be cutting about seven of these total is my guess before I get it right because it has to absolutely be perfect. Um, I am uh, very, very OCD about shots, about rattly shots or not lined up shots or just shots that just don't feel right when you actually shoot them. Uh, and you cannot simulate that in a computer. Um, there's, there's just no way to know what's going to happen until you actually play the game. So uh, I, I'm going to be cutting a bunch more of these. Um, but unfortunately, we're not going to be showing anything just because I want to keep it under wraps for a while. I thought you said that was it. What? What? Haunted House Party? Is what? that it? Haunted House Party is a theme you for sure. You told me you were working on something. I don't want to talk about it. So anyway, um, the spooky release plan. So get people ask me this all the time. So uh, after Alice Cooper, the next spooky game that will come out, the next new spooky game off the line will be the game that I'm working on right now, which is uh, very exciting and very stressful for me. But the, <laughs> the best part is if I need more time and I need to slow down, and there's demand for it, we can run TNA again once we stop. I think if there's interest, that might give me a little more time to make sure everything's right. So I'm hoping that does. Um, and I can tell you uh, from a, a business standpoint, we came off a, a couple of, uh, what do you call it, manufactured games. Uh, contract manufacturing. Yeah, contract games. manufacturing gigs, which were fantastic for Spooky. It was terrific. Uh, it gave me a little more time to work on Alice, but I still wasn't happy with where it was. So Scott having total nuclear annihilation there to kind of bail me out and give me some more time for the first time in spooky history, really, to kind of refine some things. And there's still things in it yeah, that, you know, you're, it, it, pinball's like an artist. You're never completely satisfied. Um, I've never seen anybody more nervous than Scott because my first game was Rob Zombie which sold out quick, and then it had kind of mixed reviews, and it's found its audience now, and that's all great. But Scott's first game out of the gate is like, 2017 pinball news, thank you, Martin. Game of the year, it's won trophies all over the country, so I'm telling this young man's a little nervous about, oh, I gotta follow myself with something that doesn't suck. It's called the sophomore effort. Yeah. And it usually isn't good. But, I'm uh, just kidding. He's incredibly capable. I'm super happy with what's going on right now. Yeah, and he should be. And uh, as is spooky, Scott is an absolute godsend. He's wonderful to, to work with. Uh, just a lot of good people that have helped us get where we are today. And uh, Scott's a huge part of that. And I'm going to start crying. So I'm just going to stop. It. I'm just going to nope. Do it. Nope. Nope. I'm Do not going to let Jay see me cry. I don't have a handkerchief or anything, though. You know, I could cry probably. My voice would choke up a little bit. It would probably just sound the same. We're in a very good spot. Who knows? At yeah. Our biggest selling games to date are Total Nuclear Annihilation and Alice Cooper. And they're back to back. So Actually, you don't you see us with a Katie giant right flashing light in the vendor hall right now saying, come buy our spooky games because we're trying to catch up. And that's a r considering where we started like five, six years ago, the, it's a tremendous thing to have happen for our tiny little family based company. So. And uh, yeah, so no pressure, Scott. You well, I'll tell you what, though. You know what's really cool is Alice Cooper is capped at 500 units. <laughs> and my game doesn't have a license, so we can make however many, right? It doesn't matter. Total nuclear. Is how, many, yeah, uh, how many games have sold? Uh, Scott mm. keeps calling Katie because he wants to buy 501 because that means I can never catch him. <laughs> I'm seriously gonna buy that game. <laughs> what num I don't. I don't even know what number we're at right now, but um, it's. She told me yesterday it was 4.98. Okay, guys. So, <laughs> if anyone's on the fence, right now, like, because I'm gonna make him buy me a shitty plastic trophy once I hit 501. 
Right. That I can never take back because our contract with Alice Cooper is exactly 500 units. 501, guys. Come and on. Uh, for the first time in spooky pinball history, uh, we announced it on the podcast, and it kind of got some people a little rough. Oh, we're trying to do a cash grab. We're going to build 550 total nuclear annihilations, whether they're sold or not. And we've never financially been in a position to just go, you know what? We're going to build some games. And people call, and we're all caught up. You want a total nuclear? It's sitting on the floor. You can take it. We're going to take them to shows. You can buy them there. So for us, that's a huge milestone. And uh, we're confident enough in what Scott's working on with, uh, what is it again? Haunted House Party that, uh, yeah, we're sitting pretty good right now. It feels He's pretending really, really not nice. to be mad at me right now because I wasn't supposed to show that. <laughs> yeah, don't pour it on this laptop. I need this. No. Um, so anyway, um, going back to what I'm working on now, though, the, the roles are a little different, though, than, than TNA, which is really exciting for me because um, the design, the prototyping, and the engineering will all be done by myself, which is obviously a much shorter list than TNA. Um, the rules, the software, the storyboarding, all that stuff is going to be done by spooky guys, right? So I don't have to do the programming, which is going to be awesome. Yeah, I don't want to do that again. Even though it's not difficult, it's time consuming. Um, the animations will be done in-house at Spooky, and the audio is actually up in the air at the moment. I don't know if I will do that or someone else will. I would love to, but I don't know yet. What's going on? I can write house party music, though. It was a blast last weekend. Uh, we actually had Bowen Karens, David Van Ness, uh, Scott Denisi, and myself, and we flew everybody up to Scott's house and crashed at Casa de Denisi. And yeah, that was uh, fun. It, yeah, and just kind of started planning everything out. And to have guys like Bowen and uh, David Van Ness and everybody from the get-go, where it doesn't all have to fall on one guy is absolutely tremendous. And yeah, of course, Scott's going to be directing all this, and it's going to be the way he wants it. And, and uh, to date, I've costed out exactly nothing from anything he's ever done, and that's not about to change. We would rather make a great game Wait, really? than make an extra 10 bucks. Yes, anything, exactly. Anything I put in there? Well, yeah, if we, you know, we don't need emeralds or diamonds or anything in there. But mm. Diamond-plated kickback scoops and blah. <laughs> So, um, so yeah, that's that's basically it. Um, now, I mean, let's. Uh, do you guys have any questions about any of this stuff? Uh, it's very complicated. That's a that is a terrible picture of myself. That's an awesome I was, picture. That's the, you know, that's actually the first selfie I ever took in my lifetime. <laughs> it shows. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying really hard to make it pretty. Hey, what do we got down there? Um, so the, it's called Pinix, actually, and, and it's, uh, its intention uh, is to be open source. Um, Jimmy has not got it to a point where he wants to release it yet to the public because he wants to have a release plan and, and make sure that there's support and documentation out there for it. Um, but he definitely is going to release it eventually, I think. Last time we talked, he's definitely going to release it, but he may, uh, he may have changed it. Um, it's, uh, it's a really incredible system, actually. So. It has updating capability via USB already built in. So you can just, you can honestly just stick a USB in there with code on it and it just blasts it right to the game, restarts it, boom, it's done. It, it certainly has made my life a lot easier and the tech support a lot simpler. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, so th the question is if I have any concerns about using Python um, and, it, and working within its limitations uh, going forward with the pinball machines. Um, so something interesting about how PROC works is all of the high priority stuff in terms of enabling, disabling coils, turning on and off lights, um, reading switch, scanning the switches, all of that stuff is handled in C. So there in, in C, there, it's C++ actually, but it's, that is a very highly reliable and very limitless uh, and complicated programming language, which obviously is, I do know how to program in it, I'm not good at it, but, and I don't have to be, which is the best part. Python is for laying out the rules and for laying out like when sounds should be played or when a light show should be triggered. So 
the Python limitations are not even a factor in this because of well, how we've got it structured. So it just makes it for you know programming the pinball machine much easier that way. So hopefully that answered the question. Yep. Over there. Yeah. Uh, the butter cabinets. We do those actually. Uh, it started uh, early, early on in my uh, printing career, er, early pinball career. I, I spent a long time in the in the printing industry. We convinced. Jersey Jack, that it would be just amazing to do those first thousand Emerald City limited edition WAS games in what we deemed the butter cabinets. Terry said they looked like they'd been dipped in butter. They were so pretty. It was basically direct print with automotive clear coat. There's no decals involved. Um, Jersey Jack kind of went away from it over the years, and, and it was something that I had actually come up with. And like I said, we talked Jack into it and give him, give him credit for taking the risk and trying it. Uh, we decided on Rob Zombie that at the tail end of the run, we were going to do a handful of games in that style again because we hadn't done it in a few years. And Rob Zombie has one, Terry has one, uh, Matt from Back Alley Creations, uh, who did all the toys in that game, he has one, and I have one. Uh, so there, there's only like five of those out there. But on Total Nuclear, we decided to offer it as an, uh, an upgrade. It's $1,000 because it's ridiculously hard and expensive to do that without I mean, they have to be wrapped, handled, everything special. You know, just you have to be so careful with it. Uh, and yeah, I was shocked how many people actually jumped on it. They just want something. We don't really do like an LE version of anything, but we do give you the option to upgrade some stuff that doesn't really change the gameplay, but it, it gives you a prettier package uh, for your game. And It's it's a little beyond that even. It, it's all done basically on a UV flatbed. So it's digital, which means you can get much more detail, much more vibrant. Well, not saying that screen printing, you can do some pretty crazy neon colors and stuff too. But uh, you're not gonna get the level of detail that you'll get with what we're doing. Um, it's kind of wasted a bit on the TNA cabinet art because it's meant to be retro and it, it should look like it was screen printed. Um, if you go in to Rob Anthony's room and see the Alice Cooper in there. Uh, that's a decaled version of Alice Cooper, but that in the butter edition cabinet is absolutely ridiculous. Nobody needs that. I'm not encouraging people to buy it. If you do, we encourage you to come pick your game up in person. We have shipped them as far as Australia without any problems, but uh, you have to handle them with kid gloves. And once, I mean, I'm making making them sound more fragile than they no, are. They're not fragile. They're at really all. not. The the game that's uh, if you were out at the Pinball Life open house, that thing has been all over the country. And it's been shipped where I haven't been, and it's still fine. So, but if you bang it off a door frame, you're going to cry. No, you <laughs> won't cry because I banged mine off a doorway. Um, I have a butter cabinet. I got to tell you, he's being way too careful with his stuff. Like the uh, the butter cabinet actually holds up better than a decal cabinet because I hit mine on a doorway. It put a little scratch in the clear coat, but you can just like buff it right out. I do not away. suggest this. If you do that. <laughs> If you do that with a decal cabinet, it hits the ink. If you know Doug Manley and yeah. he can come in and fix your clear coat, then well, yes. I have, I have a Doug Manley, yes. <laughs> yes. The uh, TNA for phone monitors are sort of a joke to have those. Ridiculous. It's, when you, when you play the game especially, it's meant for you to play with your friends. The ball times are not long. Uh, that makes operators extremely happy. It's fast, it's brutal, but it's also addictive and fun. Um, we have one that we operate in Benton, Wisconsin. It's Again, it's 900 people. We have three games in the bar. We have Jetsons, the original America's Most Haunted that Ben Heck and I built together, and uh, my TNA. And all the money from that goes back to the volunteer fire department in our village. The TNA cash box at 25 cents a game is overflowing every single time I go up there to clean it out. It's ridiculous. So. Oh, actually, it's super easy. Um, there's this place called, uh, it's like duplication.ca. They're from Canada. And they're one of the major players in cassette duplication right now. They also duplicate CDs, but I don't think CDs are retro enough yet. Um, but they still do tapes. Uh, tapes are making a comeback right now, which is strange to hear. Um, but people are starting to collect them. They're harder and harder to find at thrift stores. Um, all the, uh, the hipster guys are going in there and grabbing them. So... My son inherited my dad's 97 Chevy S10 with a cassette deck in it. And Scott gave him a copy of the cassette. And the first day he comes home from school, 
driving his his truck for the first time all by himself. All I hear is do 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 just Beep. shaking the whole neighborhood. <laughs> that is absolutely ridiculous. <clears throat> Any other questions? No? Yeah, one over here. Here you go. It's, um, when we first started spooking, we never, uh, it, this sounds terrible, we didn't consider operators. We just, everybody I knew was a home guy. And, you know, just, well, we were just trying to make games that made them happy. And a few people operated TNA. By the time we got to uh, Rob Zombie, it, it picked up a little bit. Uh, Domino's, a lot of those games went because it was, it was a Domino's pizza game. If you own a Domino's, you could throw it in your place. So they did that. That was kind of a, a big thing. TNA is, I wouldn't say it's 50-50, home and operator, it's probably 60-40, but the interest from operators, and it's a whole big bell learning curve for us, uh, and what it takes to keep those guys happy, um, it's ridiculous, yeah. Because as soon as word starts getting around that, hey, this pinball machine's making money and the ball times are short and, and, and people are playing in groups, it went off the rails. So we did take a little bit of flack early on that you know, some of the home guys were like, hey, why are you catering? Because we were getting games to locations where but every time we'd send a game to a location, five more would sell. And a lot of them were to home guys. They'd go and play one on location, and th they'd heard about it, but it wasn't in New York, or it wasn't in Los Angeles. And they would go there, they would play it, and they would buy it. And so we learned fast that uh, Gary Stern's not wrong. You gotta take care of some of those operators, man. They're really vital to this industry, even today. All right, well, we reached four o'clock, so thank you for again for coming and telling us all this stuff about this game.